Hello, this is Susan Schillinglaw. I am director of the National Steinbeck Center, and I'd like to welcome you to your town. Uh, today, I have Elan Portner, who is a graduate student at Hopkins Marine Station of Stanford University. And uh, the theme today has been water and people <coughs> um, talking about um, art and water. And now we're going to turn to science and water, science and the oceans because, of course, Ilan is at Hopkins to study the ocean. Yeah. So can you say a little bit about your background and what brought you to Hopkins Marine Station? Sure. So I'm from Honolulu, Hawaii, and grew up surrounded by the ocean and was always really interested in uh, the biology of, of things happening in the ocean. There are lots of amazing creatures that are pretty fairly accessible just from the coast. Uh, and I went to school to study to study marine creatures and was inspired to look a little bit away from the coast and away from the surface to study animals uh, of the deep, basically. Okay. Uh, so moving away from the coast of the last segment to pondering what's happening below that horizon is really where my research lies. Okay. Yeah. And is it difficult to select um, your animal of interest? No. There are so, it's, it's terribly easy because there are so many great options has been my perspective on it where you usually start with a question and then pick an animal based on its ability to help you answer that question. Oh. So my work is really focused on the food of our seafood. So what, what is the biology and the behavior of the animals that support animals we like to eat? like tunas and billfishes and sharks, uh, and also animals that we find socially or culturally important, like whales and, and other mammals. And they all share one common food source that's very diverse and is made up of many different kinds of animals. But they're all small fishes and shrimps uh, and squids that live away from the surface of the ocean. Interesting. Well, I love the name of all those the large creatures, charismatic mm. megafauna. Yeah. And so rather than study the charismatic me megafauna, um, sharks and whales, etc., mm. that often are featured on television right. um, programs, you are looking at what those creatures eat. Yeah, the charismatic macrofauna. <laughs> 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 because it's it's hard to argue against their charisma just just because biology is fascinating and there are lots of mo moments where there's some sort of recognition of self in what you're seeing and in, in the behavior of the animals. And then there's always amazement at the biological adaptations and morphological adaptations of these animals that are living in really low light conditions. So a lot of them uh, have amazing light organs on their bodies for disguising themselves for camouflage in the ocean and are just quite beautiful. So they inspire awe in me and many other people, and um, yeah, I'm focusing on the smaller, the smaller animals, I guess. The yeah. smaller animals. Mm -hmm. I love what, what you said about um, it, it creates some kind of recognition of self. What do you mean by that? Or just, you know, we always tend to anthropomorphize, at least, or, or we recognize expressions or behaviors in animals based on what we would understand that expression to be on another human, mm -hmm. right? I think that's right. a, a definition of anthropomorphizing. Um, and so I think just that, that it makes it easier maybe to form some sort of attachment to, okay. <laughs> like an emotional attachment to a type of animal and say, oh, I love this animal and I want to study it. And, okay, yeah. so what is your emotional attachment to? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's to, many, it's to many things. And I guess I would, I would try to say that I keep my emotional attachments <laughs> at a minimum. Li a minimum. <laughs> um, but I do, I, I, many, many animals have a special place in my heart just because they are so amazingly adapted to their habitat. So we are terrestrial animals. We live, we live on land. And one of the things I always talk about when I'm speaking to the public is sh the need to shift our perspective towards what it would be like to live in water, which is a medium completely different from air, uh, and what it would be like to live in a m much more three-dimensional environment, meaning we don't, you know, we just walk on the surface of the earth and things in the ocean move vertically thousands of feet each day, a lot of them. Um, 
And again, there's only sunlight in the upper 600 feet or so of in the clearest ocean water. So as soon as you go below that, and remember that the ocean is an average of two miles deep. So you only have light really in the top 600 meters. So below that, you have very low light levels or no light. And there's all of this really incredible biology and ecology, which is really the interaction between organisms and between organisms and their environment um, that have developed in this low light aquatic hmm. environment. You know, what strikes me is A, that well, this always, as a non-scientist, I've always been amazed at how many questions there are still unanswered for yeah. the ones, the, the animals that you've selected and other animals like why do dolphins jump out of the water? It just mm -hmm. amazes me as an English professor that somebody doesn't know that yet. Mm -hmm. And so I, I love that about science, the questions unanswered and the many questions unanswered. So what if you focus, I mean, it must have been hard to focus given your interest <laughs> in <laughs> all of these animals. It's always you hard to focus. Yeah, you have to choose something to study to do your, your thesis yeah. on. Yeah, so how, how did I focus? I think that it's something that I still am having trouble with in terms of really uh, dedicating all of my efforts to one project. I find myself spread out across several. So right now I'm working on a project with scientists based in Hawaii at uh, NOAA has a National Science Center. And uh, we're studying a fish called the Lancet fish, which is a very common predatory fish found all over the globe, and it's the most commonly captured type of fish in the longline fishery based in Hawaii. Uh, so they're targeting tunas, and for every tuna that they catch, they catch two lancet fish. And their muscle tissue, which is what we would eat, is very watery, so there's zero commercial value, and all individuals get discarded uh, back into the ocean. And I'm working on a project to use these predators as what is termed a biological sampler of these communities of a small organisms in the ocean that tunas eat and sharks eat, the micro, small, nectin swimming organisms. So how large are these? The lancet fish are, uh, let's say, one to four feet long, five feet long, something and, like that. And is that the preferred food of, say, a tuna? Um, that's interesting. I think, well, what is your preferred food? I'm not a tuna. You're not a but tuna, but I, I mean, <laughs> right, I mean in the same way that I think it's less about there being a preferred food and more about being, there available. being a preferred, right, or available but also a preferred diet. So my, I might prefer tomatoes over cucumbers, but I'll eat all of those things. You know, I, I okay. have, there's a collection of I things, see. so it's, it's less it's less cut and dry than that, and I think that that brings up a really good point about how all of these predators in the ocean that are sharing, how they share this common resource, which is, which is a community of diverse animals, mm -hmm. and all of these predators have a range of preferred foods, and there's lots of overlap between them. That's interesting, because of course otters used to prefer um, abalone, uh -huh. <laughs> but now there's very little abalone, so they have adapted and eat, right. eat other and things urchins, in the same. And it's crazy because they're, you know, we've been able to study those mammals a bit more than other animals because they're located close to the coast. And again, they're this, they're an example of these charismatic megafauna that people really rally behind. So I think that there's been a lot of good research on just choice and behavioral variation or individual variation in, in food preference in otters. So mm -hmm. there could be variation across seasons or years or you know yeah. what mood the <laughs> what mood the other is you know what do you I feel know, like tonight dear today. yeah <laughs> um, so um, so are uh, these uh, lancet fish in Monterey Bay uh, the, Mon the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute goes out into the bay every month with a camera on a robot that they send down to the same spot and they survey what's in in the ocean and they've seen it only a handful of times uh, so we can assume that either they're avoiding the camera or that this is sort of at the, the limit of their range. They don't often come very close to shore, but people have seen them washed up on the beaches in Seaside and like Del Monte Beach in Monterey okay. every once in a while. Yeah, But they're more abundant in Hawaii. Yeah, or just in the open ocean, right? Mm -hmm. So in, in habitats that are quite a bit deeper, the, the term is pelagic, this mm -hmm. open ocean. Yeah. Right, okay. 
So, and you're also studying squid, I'm correct? also studying squid uh, at Hopkins Marine Station. It's a really exciting project, and uh, I guess it aligns with, or given that it's we're coming up on cephalopod week. Yes. <laughs> so I'm studying the Humboldt squid, and it turns out, and um, my advisor, Bill Gilley, has been noticing, and him and his colleagues have been noticing over the last couple of decades now, that sometimes this squid is six feet long and sexually mature and ready to reproduce, and sometimes it's one foot long and sexually mature and ready to reproduce. And my research is really focused on understanding the environmental differences that drive maturity at a small size versus a large size. And you can imagine that a small squid, something that's a foot long, might eat very different things and be food for very different things than a squid that is six feet long. And so what are the ecological repercussions of having squid that are small versus squid that are large? Very interesting. And I know you're doing much of your that work in Baja, right? Yes. So what eats the smaller squid, the ones that, of course, the fishermen uh, aren't as happy with small squid, but right. is there, are there animals that are happier with Yeah, absolutely. Stuff. Tunas eat them, sharks, uh, whales eat them. I don't know too much about the variation in, I think in a lot of cases, it's not so much that different predators eat them, but maybe different life stages of the predators. So if you're a, a 500 pound tuna, it might cost a lot of energy to eat a one foot squid and you might not get enough calories out of it versus eating a three-foot squid. So there's, you know, I, I didn't like tomatoes when I was a kid, and now I love them. So there are changes with growth, um, and I guess with life stage, uh, with respect to the food that you prefer or that you select. Mm -hmm. And these are different from, of course, the market squid we yeah. get in Monterey mm -hmm. um, Bay. Uh, that we enjoy as calamari often. Yeah. Uh, and do you are you studying market squid as well? I am not. There are people in my lab who are studying the market squid. And if you go and get uh, calamari rings here, that's usually the market squid. If you ever get a calamari steak, uh, that's going to be usually the Humboldt squid, which is the squid that I study. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's not because they're not interesting. It sort of goes back to this problem or because it's not really a problem, but this idea that there are so many unanswered questions and that sort of positive reinforcement of even when you seem to answer a question that you've posed, you usually generate many more questions. <laughs> and so it's this um, self-fulfilling prophecy of continuing work, I guess, or positive right. feedback loop. And so what about uh, as this interaction between um, the lancet fish and the tuna. Mm -hmm. um, are there fewer tuna in Hawaii now, and is there concern about that? Of course, oh, there are fewer Oh, that's very tuna. interesting. Um, yes, that is a very interesting question. I don't know that I have enough information to tell you. I, th I think that the trend, so the way that fisheries quantify how much of a fish they're catching is um, the unit is catch per unit effort, so they don't just tell you how many tunas they're catching, they're telling you how many tunas they're catching per the number of, per thousand hooks that they set, basically. So you normalize the number of fish that you catch over the effort that you've expended to catch those fish. And as far as I know, that hasn't been decreasing over the past few years, but that doesn't mean that the population isn't doing poorly. Okay. Right? I don't have I don't have any information on the health of the tuna stocks, um, but they have set so many hooks that it's not like they're catching so many lancet fish that there aren't hooks available for tunas. It's just that now they're catching more lancet fish. Okay, yeah. so when they when they put down hooks, of course yeah. there are several hooks on a line. So mm -hmm. there may be one tuna on one hook and two or three lancet fish fish on other hooks. Is that yeah exactly? Is that how they're catching them? And yeah. then they just throw them. Back, so they're bycatch. Yeah. yeah, exactly. The lancet fish are are incidentally captured, and it's not economically viable to keep them in the hull. There's no commercial value, so they're they're discarded. Yeah, yeah. which is too bad. It is too bad. Um, it's great for my for my work because there's an amazing federal fisheries observer program. So uh, to ensure that the industry is complying with federal um, standards and rules, I guess, for fisheries management. 
a 20% of the longline tuna fleet has federally trained fisheries observers on board that record uh, everything that comes on to the vessel. And they have a oh. biological sampling program or a sampling program where you can request samples from them. So because the fishermen are catching so many lines of fish and there are these federal observers on board, we can request that the observers collect lancet fish for us. And so it's a way to uh, get samples from all across the North Pacific, samples of lancet fish, uh, through a program that already exists. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. It's a kind of nice intersection between private, well, a public ins entity, the government, and private research, right? Yeah, absolutely. So that's, that's wonderful. So, and what are you studying about the lancet fish? What do you, would you well, want to so know what they eat? Yeah, exactly. So they share that same food resource with uh, tunas and sharks, uh, but they don't digest their food very quickly. So we do we study their diet and we look to see if their diet changes across the North Pacific Ocean. And we know that the habitat changes across the North Pacific Ocean, right? It's warmer near the equator and cooler up at more temperate latitudes. And there's also variation in the amount of plants, right? In the amount of production in these ecosystems. Uh, so we're trying to measure how these prey animals, these tuna prey, respond to variation, natural variation in their habitat. Oh. Yeah, with the goal of improving our understanding of how these open ocean ecosystems function as a whole. So right now we know a lot about the plants of the ocean, these, pri these primary producers, they're mostly single-celled plants called phytoplankton. And when they're abundant, they discolor the water and we can see that from space. So we can use satellite imagery to quantify how much primary production there is at the base of food, oceanic food webs. And then we have a lot of information on top predators in open ocean food webs because we eat them and they support coastal economies through fisheries and through tourism. But these organisms in between them, right, the tuna prey, the micronectin, are really poorly studied. So we're trying to use lancet fish and also squid to understand what's happening uh, in the center of open ocean food webs. Very eloquent, Thank so <laughs> a very nice statement of your research. Um, you. I am struck by, you know, Stein, I bring it back to John Steinbeck, but mm -hmm. he said that uh, the United States, this was of course in the 60s, was spending much more time and energy studying space and we knew nothing mm -hmm. about oceans. I think this so is still true. He went on the Mohole Project actually where we're drilling the ocean floor, cool. which is a kind of complicated story, but mm -hmm. um, he was very curious about what was beneath the surface of the ocean all of his life. So Smart guy. Yeah, <laughs> smart guy. <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Ilan. It's wonderful to talk to you. And thank you for joining us uh, this week on Our Town, Your Town, Our Town. Both. <laughs> Everyone's yeah. town, yeah. Uh, and it's been wonderful to speak to you, and thank you very much. This is Susan Schillinglaw, director of the National Steinbeck Center, and um, again, my thanks.